Hello and welcome back to yet another episode in Delphi University's CSC 280 Introduction to Cybersecurity. Today we'll start um, our discussion with a number of videos on vulnerabilities and vulnerability management. Vulnerabilities are in many um, ways the heart and core of cybersecurity. The basic concept is that a vulnerability is a weakness in a system, and whether that's a system that's purely software, whether it's a combination between software and hardware, or maybe even a full socio-technical system that involves people, processes, and procedures, a vulnerability is a weakness, and it's specifically a weakness um, that can cause an attacker to cause harm. So that's all a vulnerability is, a weakness that can cause harm. Now, all systems have vulnerabilities. There is no such thing as a perfectly safe system. Some systems, though, are more easily exploitable than others. And what we're trying to do is to develop, design, and build systems that resist uh, vulnerabilities and that are defensible by the defenders. So to understand why I say that all systems are potentially vulnerable to these, these mistakes, we first have to understand why that's true. So first of all, systems, and especially technical systems that involve um, artifacts, that means things built by people, um, are just that. They are built by people, and people make mistakes. Because of that, the systems that people make have mistakes in them. Now, not all of those mistakes can cause, you know, the worst case scenario is almost unauthenticated remote code execution, where an attacker can run whatever software they want on a computer, whether or not they have legitimate access to it. Um, but still, there is a vulnerability. Sometimes those vulnerabilities are fundamental to the design of the system, and those are very difficult to solve. A system that is poorly designed, but completely well built according to that design is still vulnerable. And that means that an insecurely designed system probably will have to be scrapped or at least significantly overhauled before we can remediate those situations. Fortunately, we don't see too many examples of things that are flawed by design. Um, that used to be different, but now we've at least know from a design perspective more or less what we should and should not be doing. The second category is systems that were built with a flaw in them, even though they were designed properly. And especially when it comes to software, those are often the easiest one to fix. I can just load new software onto my system, of course, providing that that system allows us to do so. Um, and that new version of the software then should fix whatever the old version had wrong with it. This is one of the major concerns that we're seeing at the moment with regards to the Internet of Things and to a similar extent to industrial control systems, ICS systems. Those systems were, some, in many cases, not designed with the ability to update the software easily, where you know, in order to update software, you may have to replace physical components, or you may have to have physical, hands-on interaction with the device, um, if updates are available altogether. And of course, that does not make getting systems secure very easily. So part of what we are looking for today when we design systems is that they are inherently easy to upgrade. Um, of course, that brings to it also its own issues. If you design an update mechanism that isn't secure, it could be used to introduce malware. But the ability to update, um, to fix mistakes in software is critical to current day cybersecurity hygiene. Even if the system is designed completely correctly and the software is implemented completely correctly, there is still the third possibility of things that can go wrong because most software today, especially enterprise software, needs to be configured before we can use it. And if that configuration is incorrect, it doesn't matter how secure your software or your architecture is, you're still vulnerable to exploitation. 
configuration mistakes are even easier to fix than um, implementation mistakes, but they still need to be fixed. And then lastly, we have this beautiful system. It's well architected, it's built correctly, it is implemented correctly, and now we let people touch it. And as soon as we introduce humans, we know that we have a whole other vulnerability category right there. People make mistakes, people are in a rush, they don't know what the right thing to do is, and people can be compelled. Whether it is through trickery or through violence, you can make people do things that they don't want to do. And as a result, you've just introduced additional vulnerabilities into your system as well. When we talk about vulnerabilities and vulnerability management, there's a couple of terms that we have to uh, separate and um, look at completely distinct. Although I have to say in everyday speech, we probably use them interchangeably. They do mean different things. And those terms are risk, threat, attack, and attacker. And let's look at those in a little bit more detail. So, we want to have a system that um, is designed in such a way that we assume there are vulnerabilities. And that means that if we know that there might be vulnerabilities in a system, we have to design it in such a way that we can deal with failure. We know what's going to happen. You know, this is, for example, when we build levees and dams. We purposefully build weak spots in those levees and those dams so that when they break we can predict where they're going to break and of course we pick that location in a way that damage would be minimized and so it's designing for failure and to the extent possible we'd like to do the same thing in software if something's going to break we don't want to know where it's going to break and um, it's going to break before uh, other areas in areas that do less harm so what's a vulnerability? I already mentioned that. It's a weakness in a system. It's a system that a weakness that could cause harm, weak authentication, limited access control, and poorly configured cryptography. All of those are vulnerabilities. A vulnerability by itself is not dangerous. If I have a vulnerability and no one is around to exploit it, I don't have a problem. The problem starts to happen when we introduce the threat agent, the person who is willing and able to target a vulnerability. And so only when I put the threat agent and the vulnerability together, now I got a little bit of a head scratcher. The threat agent without a vulnerability is not dangerous. The vulnerability without the threat agent is not dangerous. The two combined, yeah, that's a problem. They create a threat. Um, so if, for those of you who have seen Mr. Robot, Elliot was the threat agent, the thermostat, the IoT thermostat was, had the vulnerability, but it didn't become an issue until Elliot started to load his custom firmware onto that thermostat. And so the combination of the two, that's the threat. The risk is an attempt at least at quantifying how bad the threat is. And we do that by looking at impact and likelihood. We've talked about that before in previous videos. And so we'll try to keep those together as separate, especially vulnerability, threat, and risk. But um, I'll probably slip up here and there. If I do, forgive me, but you know, everyone else does too. In order to understand risk and threats, we um, have developed some uh, mechanisms. Um, Stride and Dread are two of them. Uh, Stride is much more popular than Dread. Dread's kind of, you know, done and over with, but I left it on the slide here for historical purposes. For now, though, let's focus on Stride. Stride is an easy enough acronym to remember. It means spoofing, tempering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. Those are things that could go wrong. Um, characterize the threats by their nature. What happens you know, to a building? Well, a building could catch fire. Great. What happens to a computer system? Well, someone could be spoofing their identity. And so when we try to analyze a computerized um, system, a technical infrastructure, we look at these categories. How certain am I that I am talking to the person who they claim to be? In other words, how easy is it to spoof their identity? And if they do spoof an identity, what's the effect of that? And how do I prevent that? 
tampering, of course, as we saw that also when we had computer tampering in the legal definitions, that means that you're making unauthorized changes to data and otherwise you're compromising data integrity. I want to prevent that as well. Can I do that? How can I do that? Where can I do it? What's the impact of it? All of those are questions to ask. Repudiation is, is an issue, especially when it comes to business transactions. It basically means that you can deny that a transaction has ever taken place. Um, so, you know, the pizza guy shows up with 10 pizzas, um, hands them over to you, asks for payment, and you go, well, I never ordered those, but thank you. Um, you know, that's repudiation. Someone's going to take a hit somewhere. Information disclosure is all about information being released where it shouldn't have been released in the first place. We want to make sure that we're aware of that. Um, we talk about denial of service, attacks against the availability component of the CIA triad. Like how could we do that? How could we deny service? How could we make this system crash or make unavailable to its legitimate customers? And lastly, elevation of privileges. In other words, you're breaking out um, of or working around an access control system where the goal of the access control system was to limit your privilege and instead you try to elevate it. If we think about these um, what is it? six particular components of cybersecurity, and we also keep in mind those three of the CIA triad, then we can do some pretty good analysis on how secure a system is. In other words, how insecure, how vulnerable a system is. Um, DREAD was a, um, an initiative, an effort to quantify how dangerous um, a risk was associated with a threat by quantifying some of those. We have different mechanisms to do that now, but they're often combined uh, risk, uh, stride and dread. I'm not going to talk much about dread at all. Now, a vulnerability is just that. It's a vulnerability. Um, and that is actually an interesting thing. We can think about this as a race. It's a race between attackers and defenders. And so let's talk about this vulnerability life cycle and figure out how it works. At some point, whether it's during design, whether it's during implementation, during configuration, or during operation, a vulnerability is introduced. We don't have a problem yet. All we have is a vulnerability, but it just, you know, it's there. Um, the next stage would be the fact that someone discovers that vulnerability. Until a vulnerability is discovered, it's not dangerous. So now we have a discovered vulnerability. And that this vulnerability gets disclosed somehow or not. We have a whole separate video in which we talk about disclosure strategies. But for now, let's take that as a mile, mile point. Introduction of the vulnerability, a discovery and disclosure. Once a vulnerability is disclosed, we start a race. It's a race that um, happens between attackers and defenders. Let's first look at the, um, the defenders side. When Say that I'm a software manufacturer and I'm notified or I become otherwise aware that I have a vulnerability in my product. You know, the first thing I want to do um, is, well, first of all, confirm that there's actually a problem. But second of all, I want to fix that problem. I want to develop a patch. You know, so I want to change the software that was vulnerable to something that is not vulnerable or change the configuration that was vulnerable to something that isn't vulnerable. But that's me, that's the vendor, that's the person who created the software or the configuration. I'm not necessarily the one using it. So I want to get that patch, the fix, out to all of my customers, everyone who uses my software. And that by itself is a hard problem to solve. You know, a good software manufacturer has hundreds of thousands, if not millions of users. Think, for example, of a web browser manufacturer. If they develop, uh, discover a vulnerability in the web browser and fix it, it's great that Google has a fix for Chrome, but until that fix is deployed to everyone's computer, it really doesn't matter all that much. Now, before they send it out, they want to test it. They want to make sure that this patch, uh, even though it might address the issue that it's trying to solve, doesn't introduce any additional issues, at least not reasonably believing so. Eventually then, we get the patch out and we deploy it to our customers. When that is done, when all of my customers have deployed my patch, now that vulnerability is no longer a vulnerability and the threat associated with it is gone. There is no risk left. On the other hand, if I learn about a vulnerability 
and I am an attacker, the first thing I want to do is, hey, can I write software that exploits this vulnerability, that makes the computer do something it wasn't intended to do? That's called exploit development. If it does, I'm going to release it. I don't have to test it because, you know, maybe it doesn't work as well, but so be it. You know, it's fine under most circumstances. Um, and I can develop a proof of concept or anything to those nature. Now, eventually we want to refine that a little bit to make an exploit more easily usable. We call that weaponization. And in the end, a weapon is only a weapon when it's used and someone has to then exploit that weapon or the exploit. If the exploit weaponization completes before the patches have been deployed, the attackers win the race. Because now they have systems that are vulnerable and exploitable. If the defenders win with that patch deployment before the weaponized exploits are available and ready for use, the defenders have won. And this is an ongoing battle, constantly, many times a day, that we see a vendor announcing a vulnerability and a fix and encouraging all of their customers to deploy this. Um, and it's still one of the most common vulnerabilities that you'll find to gain access to enterprise networks. Maybe at this point not the most common one, the most common avenue onto an enterprise network today is social engineering, and we have a whole other week of that down the road. Um, but um, the fact that software can be vulnerable, but can also be fixed pretty easily, that's the core of vulnerability and vulnerability management. Um, the process of discovering vulnerabilities, especially known vulnerabilities, and getting those patches out is the bread and butter of many security operations. Patch management, vulnerability management, vulnerability scanning, you know, doing that well will protect you from a very significant part of threats on the network. So that's the vulnerability lifecycle. Um, in the next video, we'll talk about vulnerability disclosure strategies all the way back to the beginning of this, this discussion we had, once I have discovered a vulnerability, what do I do with it? Who do I tell? Do I tell anyone? When do I tell them? How do I tell them? Um, all of those are good questions to ask, and especially to ask before you need the answers. So let's do a whole video just about vulnerability disclosure strategies, and that one is next.